to my world Won't you come on in Hej, mit navn. Det er Stig Ulrichs, og welcome to my world. I denne uge har jeg fået Sam Thompson i studiet. Han var sikkerhedsvagt for Elvis Presley og arbejdet med ham igennem flere år. Lige nu er han i Randers, hvor der er Memphis Garden Party. Sam, it's so great to see you again. Stig, nice to see you too. Thank you. It's a couple of years since you were here last time, I think. Yeah, I think I was here maybe three years ago, and this is actually my fourth visit to Randers. I've known uh, Hendrik Knudsen. I think I came here in 1992 for the very first time. I think it's the first time I saw you in Denmark, actually. Mm -hmm. I So, of course, that was with uh, Cheryl Nielsen and... Uh, John Wilkinson. John Wilkinson. And both, unfortunately, have passed away now, so... Yeah. Yeah, I've been here so many times, I should be able to speak Danish. What do you think? Yeah. All I know is Sintok. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. But do you like it being here in Randers uh, in Denmark? Oh, yeah, it's beautiful here. I, 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 love, I love Scandinavia. I actually, I did the uh, Ancestry.com DNA test a year or so ago. And I, I, my sister and I, Linda, we came back about 50% Scandinavian and, uh, and a large percentage Scottish. So Scandinavian and Scotland are where my ancestors came from. And we've been in Scandinavia for the last 10 days. We were in Stockholm visiting friends and then Copenhagen. Uh, and now we've come to Randers to, to see uh, Henrik and participate in the garden party. Yeah, it's some kind of convention he's putting up there because it's not only you coming there, it's also your sister Linda is here, mm. there is uh, Dick Grobe, uh, yeah. James Burton and many mm. others. Is it usual, is it normal that you have so many Elvis people together in one place when they have these conventions? Well, um, it, it is a little unusual that you have this many in one spot, I will say that, because you also have uh, t uh, Terry Blackwood from the Imperials and of course the entire Imperials. Uh, but Terry was actually with the original Imperials and with Elvis. Uh, in addition, you've got Stump Monroe, uh, Jerome Monroe, who was the drummer for the Sweet Inspirations on tour with us. You've got Glendy Harden, who was our piano player. Uh, of course, James Burton, our, our guitar player, and then Dick and I, we both were in charge of security. So, and Linda. So you have quite a few people who actually had a, a direct linear connection to Elvis and knew him. Um, most of us quite well and traveled with him on the road. Usually on, on these events sometimes you'll have one and sometimes two. But uh, Henrik's put together a, a, a pretty nice cast here. And it's always so much fun for us, Stig, to see each other. You know, 41 years since Elvis died and he was only 42 when he died. So this is a chance uh, in, in great part for many of us to reconnect with people that we may have not have seen in many years. And it's also special to meet with old friends, old colleagues after so many years. I don't think there's many working places where you'll meet with your colleagues from back in time, 41 no, years. No, and you know there are very few of us left. We've uh, unfortunately lost a, a good number of our, our close friends over the years, you know, that uh, have passed away. Uh, Joe Gersio, Elvis's musical conductor, died not too long ago, and Joe Esposito. Of course, Red West, Sonny West, uh, Joe Mascale with the Imperials. Uh, we've just, with, without trying to name them all, I don't want to do anybody a disservice, but we've lost so many close friends, there's only really just a handful of us left. So, uh, so it's always good to get out and talk about Elvis and reminisce and talk about the good times we had on the road. Sonny West told me when he was in Denmark at my wedding, actually, he was a... Wait, did, why didn't you come to my wedding, by the way? Me? Yeah. I didn't know you got married. No. I got married when uh, Memphis Mansion opened because I had this great idea to Henrik that he should have a wedding the place. And he said, oh, but I don't know anybody getting married. So, uh, and I said, oh, it should not be the problem for it. I will, I will go home and uh, ask my girlfriend if she will marry me. That's, oh, that's another story. Anyway. And are you still married to this girlfriend? Yes. And oh. she, said, she actually said to me, oh, you know, honey, I actually wished for a small wedding in a church. So I said, oh, honey. We can always get married in the church. Couldn't it be fun just getting married when Memphis Mansion's open and the mayor will, will um, give us to each other and Susie Quattro will be there and many others will be there? And I said, no. <laughs> but I, I, I actually managed to get her into the idea and I said, but honey, it's no problem. We'll have a small, nice church wedding a little bit later. And that's now 
how many years? Seven years ago now. You, so you need to hang. Don't see it, honey. Close the television now. <laughs> you need to hang out to this woman. <laughs> <laughs> but back, to, uh, Sony said, uh, said uh, Sony said that um, that was the whole thing. You got me on the wrong <laughs> league. Lead here. Yeah. Uh, he said that actually, uh, when you hear from me, I was one of the people who was there. One day we are not here anymore, and then you have to hear from people who retell the story again. Yeah, again. you know, I, I had this conversation with um, Daryl Tony, who is one of the singers in the Imperials now. And of course, Daryl never knew Elvis. He's one of the replacements. But he uh, he mentioned to me yesterday. He said, "You know, we're at the point now where um, we have some of you guys who knew Elvis, but soon, uh, maybe maybe not too soon, hopefully." Uh, it'll be down to third per party people who say, well, I didn't know Elvis, but I knew someone who did know Elvis. Uh, and that's rather, you know, uh, unsettling and shocking for you to think that, that time passes. But I turned 70 years old just a few days ago, and I was one of the younger ones. Most of the guys are in the late 70s. So, you know, I suppose it's just the way of the world. It's inevitable that, you know, we're going to shuffle off this mortal coil ourselves at some point. Uh, and then, of course, it will be people like Daryl Tony and others that will tell the stories that we've told them. Uh, now, what happens after that? I don't know. But, you know, we're in an age of technological uh, breakthroughs. I hear stories about uh, holograms and, you know, things like that. So who knows what, what this world will look like if it will exist. I mean by the Elvis world, if it will even exist in 50, 60 years. Uh, it's kind of exciting, really. I wish I could hang around and watch. <laughs> well, it's possible, actually. We well, get older and older nowadays, so it's possible if you take yeah. good care of yourself. Then well, this freeze dry. Uh, I'll be sitting here with you if I'm living long enough with you in 50 years from now. I'm yeah. saying, oh, Sam, do I remember last I, time? I, I, with a cane. You know, they could just freeze dry <laughs> me and bring me back. So. We're going to talk about this guy. I can't remember his name right now. You know, he had the sideburns. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hope it doesn't come to that. <laughs> <laughs> but same, uh, you have been traveling around for a long time. Of course, you had your job also, but you started yeah. doing it because people ask you to come to these conventions yeah. and talk yeah. about Elvis. Don't you ever get tired of telling these stories uh, about your time with Elvis? Well, I get physically tired sometimes, you know, and just. But and I don't do much of this anymore. But um, I, uh, I had a career before Elvis, and uh, and I went to work with Elvis because he asked me to, and he had done so much for me and for my family. And I've said this many times, I had, a, I had a personal sense of obligation to the man. He was my friend. I met, met him in 1972. He bought a house for my parents. He bought me a house in 1973. He bought my sister a house. He bought us cars, jewelry. He took us on trips. Um, we were friends. And, um, and then in 1976, whenever um, he, he fired Sonny and Red West, he came to me and he said, I really need you. To, to come and do this for me. Well, what, would, what could I say? You know, I, I owed him. And, uh, and I suppose in some sense, too, I wanted to do this, you know. And so I, I did. And a couple of years, you know, I did this about, about, full, about a year and a half full time with Elvis. But I had done it part time for the last, before that, from 1972, you know. So it was nothing new. I'd worked with Red and Sonny and Dave Hebler and all those guys. So, you know, uh, uh, after that, when Elvis died, I went right back to my job and went to law school and became a, a lawyer. And I was a prison warden. I was a judge, uh, and I was a record executive in California. I had a, a record company. We had the Coors, which you may know. And in fact, I brought them to Stockholm at one point 20 years ago. But uh, I had other jobs. I was the chairman of the Public Utilities Commission for the state of Nevada, uh, regulating the uh, energy and environment. So, and I retired several times. So these Elvis events for me are not economically based, if you know what I mean. Um, I don't mean to, to, to uh, be pompous or disregard anybody's motives, but I like to come and tell the stories to people who want to hear the stories. I don't come necessarily to make the money. Uh, I come to visit and go places that I want to go to, uh, see people that I want to see like Henrik, some old friends that I've made. Uh, and to talk about Elvis to the fans and sort of explain um, the human nature side of Elvis. I, I like to talk about that quite a bit. People idolize him. And sometimes it's, it's, as Elvis used to say, it's hard to live up to an image. 
It's hard to live up to what other people think that you are, their perspective. Uh, I'm big on perspective. I'm big on saying, you know, it really life depends uh, m m really much on your latitude and longitude of where you're born, how you live out your life culturally. And we're all that way. Uh, and we all have our isms, as we call it, our biases and our perspectives and our beliefs, and they color our opinion. So everybody has their story to tell. And, and you know, uh, the guys that worked for Elvis, even on stage, if you get three of us together and we tell about one incident, it will all be just a little different. And it doesn't mean that we're wrong. It just means from where we were standing and how we perceive things that we, it resonated with us in a different way. So we tell our truth as we know it, it's still the truth. So I, I love doing that. I love getting together and I was with Dick Grove last night and he and I were actually talking about different incidents and he would tell his side and I would tell mine. We would look at one another and say, well, they both sound right, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I, I really do enjoy these trips, but as I get older, it's a bit tougher to do and, uh, and, and fewer people to get back together with. And it's a long travel going all the way to Europe. It must be easier traveling just around America yeah. when you live there. Um, another thing is also, as you also say, is that people intend to make, we like to make Elvis bigger, mm. you know, not human than mm. what he actually was. He was a human with yeah. good sides, bad sides, for they were just like everybody else. He was just a star who earned billions and people adored. Well, he was, and you know, nobody would appreciate that more than Elvis. Uh, Elvis had this wonderful sense of humor, and he had this, this laugh that was just captivating. When Elvis walked into a room, he was electric. He had so much charisma. You might not even see him walk into the room, but you could sense it and feel it. And I, I saw that many times. And when he laughed, we all laughed. And it wasn't one of those laughs like, okay, the boss laughed, so we all laughed too. Ha, ha, ha. It was his, we actually laughed at his laugh. It was infectious. Uh, and Elvis had what, what we would call a, a self-deprecating humor. You, do you know what I mean when I say that? It, he, he was okay for him to make fun of himself. Uh, he would make fun of you and, 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 and everyone else, but he made fun of himself. He, like Monty Python was his type of humor. He loved Monty Python, uh, you know, and, and uh, the Pink Panther, things like that. Uh, sort of showing the weaknesses and the foibles of the human character. And so, you know, we, we all made jokes and played pranks and tricks upon one another. So I think if, if, if anybody would really appreciate uh, someone explaining that Elvis Presley was human, it would be Elvis Presley, to be quite honest with you. Funny story, I was at Graceland one night and he and I were talking, and he was in a bit of a down mood and he said, you know, he said, I, I just wish I could get out. I wish I could just get out of the house and just get out there with the people. And there was an old panel truck that, that we kept in the back of Graceland. And back in those days, the back gate was just a little gate. And I said, you know, Elvis, you can put a baseball cap or something on and I'll drive that truck and you get in the truck with me and we'll leave out that back gate and nobody will know and we'll go out and have a burger, we'll, we'll drive around. And he looked at me funny and he says, well, what if some of the fans are out there? They won't know who I am. And I looked at him, I said, well, isn't that the point, <laughs> you know? And he started to laugh. So at the same time that he wanted to do those things, he loved, loved, loved being Elvis Presley. You know, it was most important to him to still have that persona and to, because he knew, Stig, that his fans expected that. Um, you know, that's a great responsibility, too, uh, to not maybe really be yourself because the fans didn't really want you to be yourself at that time. They wanted you to be that person they thought you were. So Elvis played that role. He played that role his entire life. So when I tell people that Elvis Presley gave all he had for as long as he could, I really mean it. Uh, he played a role his entire life. Uh, there were a few of us who were very fortunate behind the scenes at Graceland, uh, sitting around talking, who really got to know the real Elvis Presley. Uh, that's the guy that I like to talk about. Who is the real Elvis Presley? I think the real Elvis Presley was someone who grew up in abject poverty, um, uh, you know, uh, was probably mothered quite a bit by, by his mom, Gladys, protected, overprotected, uh, and, um, and was, and was uh, struck by lightning. I don't know how else to put it, but one day just a, 
underachieving kid in Memphis driving a truck, not really knowing what's going to happen in his life. The next day on the radio uh, as, as, as a rockabilly star, uh, inventing a new genre of music, uh, creating uh, uh, new norms with people and becoming rich and famous beyond his wildest dreams. You know, he even said it a couple of times is that, you know, um, that he's become the hero that he, that he dreamed about, uh, you know, in his dreams. And uh, it, it, it happened so suddenly and so quickly that uh, I don't think anybody would be prepared for it. And I think he did the best he could to cope with it. Uh, it's, I don't think it's really up to us to judge whether he was successful in coping with that because we didn't stand in those shoes. That didn't happen to us. I think it's enough to say that he did cope with it as best he could. And, and I think he did for the most of his life. And he was also uh, a seeker. Um, there was a TV show recently uh, put out called The Searcher. And I used to, I, I, when I saw that, I looked at my wife and said, they stole my word. Because I, when I used to talk over uh, the last 30, 40 years, I would call El, talk about Elvis. I said he was a seeker and a searcher, and he was. Uh, he was always looking for meaning in life. Uh, and, and also the meaning of really and truly why this had happened to him, these wonderful things, why him? Uh, and he, he never did really reconcile that. I mean, he certainly didn't feel like he earned it, that he deserved it. He was appreciative of it, but uh, he coped with what life brought him. And I, I think in many ways, he, I know he did the best he could, but even from an objective observance, I think we have to say that Elvis did quite well. If you look at it now, 40 years after yeah. he passed away, yeah. people still love him, people still come to these meetings, uh, people still listen to his music, you mm. know, they even see some of his movies, if some of them were not as good not as so we good. could hope for, which means that he actually did a very, very good job being Elvis Presley. Yeah. I and don't you think know, anybody and else could have done it better. Well, and he didn't like his movies. We, uh, we, we, so we would be at the mansion sometimes, and we didn't call it the mansion, we'd be at Graceland, and you know, somebody said, well, let's watch, he said, are you kidding, don't watch, he didn't want to watch any of his movies. He, the only movie he told me that he actually enjoyed was King Creole. He said he liked making the movie and he liked the music in the movie, but he did not care for the other movies. And when we wanted to really mess with Elvis, one of our practical jokes is uh, the, we would stand on the side of the stage when he was performing and uh, he would be talking to the fans and one of us would kind of yell out to Elvis, play, play, sing the shrimp song. You know, or some some little silly song he had done in a movie, and he would just look over at us and sneer. You know, <laughs> but he he wasn't a fan of of his movies. But uh, what's remarkable is all these years later, those movies are still quite popular. So and back then he couldn't be that wrong regarding people want to see it. You know, and it was also another way to hear Elvis sing. Probably mm. that's the reason why some of those not so good songs were in the movies. I guess. Yeah, and yeah. people. By it, you know. Well, but 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 regarding Elvis, well, I had one thing I would say also to come back to this with the the searcher thing because that was something that upset me a little bit. Uh, it was I think it was Priscilla Presley was quoted saying uh, and telling about a letter Joe Esposito found next to Elvis's body that he was tired of life. I don't know if it was out in American media, but it was out in Danish media. So everybody was writing about. It. I thought, oh, I had to go in and tell them something else. This is not true, but. But um, uh, she was saying that he might have killed himself, you know. But as far as I can understand from Lama Fike and Martin Lega, you know, he was probably surprised that he was ending this way. He had no plans of ending that way. Uh, and who would die that way? Nobody would, I think. Do you believe that he should have, uh, have uh, killed himself? I, I, think, uh, I think all of that is just internet uh, garble. I really do. I think it's rumor. Uh, I don't really believe that, that Priscilla said any of those things. I think she, whatever, whatever she said, I think she was misinterpreted. That's my opinion. And I think from what I've seen uh, on social media and that type of thing, that she's tried to correct that and say, look, I was, you know, you, you misunderstood what I was trying to say. That's just an opinion. I, and, and of course, I'm not Priscilla and I don't know, but I was with Elvis the night uh, before he passed away. I was there until about two o'clock in the morning. So I can tell you that Elvis Presley was excited about the next tour. Uh, he, he made comments to several of us that it was going to be one of the best tours that he had ever done. He was getting ready to make some changes in his life uh, and he wanted to do new things. And, uh, I, you know, now whether all that was real and would it have happened or not, but his frame of mind was positive. 
Uh, I do not think that Elvis Presley, who, as I've said, loved being Elvis Presley, uh, would, would have ever contemplated hurting himself. Uh, and to be quite, let's just be honest, uh, Stig, the, the way that he was found is, it was a rather ignominious uh, way to, for, for loved ones to find you. Uh, there are many other ways um, that with a, a little more dignity that one could decide to end one's life. Uh, so, I mean, you just put two and two together. This was a, a tragic, horrible incident that occurred. And no, Elvis Presley, in my opinion, did not contemplate suicide, want to kill himself, and wasn't depressed and didn't want to be Elvis. He, he was ready to go on tour the next day. And that's what I heard from some of the other guys. I, you think, know, that's, but I think that's and, the truth. And truth. another thing is also that some people put up like, oh, but it was the book from David Hepler, Sonny West and Red West. And Many fans don't like them, but the fact is just, according to Billy Smith, it's just that Elvis already put up his idea about if anybody ever confronted him with anything from the book, he already knew what to say about that book and the things, and okay, he maybe changed his mind during the days, but he had a good way he would handle it and tell it, so there's no reason for him to start doing anything stupid because of that, because according to Billy, he was ready to go out on that tour, and if anybody was approaching him with any of the rumors, he had something to tell them right away about what he meant about that book. And if it gets too close, he would say, oh, I might have some small problems, but I'll fix it and get, you know. Well, let me say this. I think that, that uh, the two people that were the closest, you know, there's a lot of people that walk around and, and build themselves as Elvis's best friend, or they're called Elvis's best friend. The two people, in, and I was not Elvis's best friend. I, he, he might have been my best friend, or certainly extremely good to me, and from what I looked at him and thought of him as my best friend. But now what a man thinks in his own mind, Stig, who knows? But from observation, I can tell you that it was Billy Smith that probably was the closest to him. He was his cousin. He lived in Graceland. Um, he was with Elvis uh, from, um, from a child, from uh, early, you know, early childhood. Uh, and uh, I think in many ways, uh, Elvis looked at Billy almost like a son. I mean, he took care of him and, uh, and loved him. So I don't think anybody was closer to Elvis than Billy. And then probably Joe Esposito because Joe traveled with him. He was with him 16, 17 years. So those two guys are, you know, in competition for the best friend role. If, that, if that's important to people, it's really not to me. But, uh, uh, but I, I believe what Billy said would be true. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I, I would, if, if I had to decide with anybody, it would be with Billy. He certainly had the insight there. Yeah. So if anybody still believes in that stupid rumor, they now have another side of the story. Well, the only other thing I want to say is I've heard people say, oh, you know, that book killed Elvis. That book did not kill Elvis. Uh, what killed Elvis is pretty well known. And uh, the, uh, without getting into all of those details, the truth is, is that uh, much of what's in that book uh, is true. Uh, much of, and, and there's a lot in that book that was dramatized, as I understand. Dave Hebler just recently wrote a book, a book and in his book, uh, he, he explains that uh, it was a ghost writer and uh, they didn't have any control over it. Red told me the same thing. Uh, Sonny told me the same thing years ago. So I have no reason to doubt those guys. And certainly we know the industry. So those things are, are no doubt probably true. Uh, this whole incident got beyond those guys. You know, they were hurt, they were angered when they were fired, uh, didn't know how to respond. Um, I'm, I'm one of those guys who believes that had they not done what they'd done, in a few months Elvis would have called them back and hired them back. That's the way I feel about it. Elvis absolutely loved Red West. They were lifelong friends. But they were hurt and they were angered and uh, they were desperate, you know, I mean, to be cut off economically like that. And, and put it up that way, just saying that it was actually not Elvis, according to what I've been told, was Elvis had told his dad to give them much more payment uh, uh, from that. But his daddy was a little bit cheap on it and gave them one week, well, uh, I think eight days or ten days, whatever it was. He yeah. Well, as, again, as a disclaimer. Uh, I don't claim to, to have the inside information and don't know, but I, but I was there during that period of time in Graceland, around Graceland, around Elvis, around Linda. Uh, and so but most of what I know, almost all of what I know is what I observed and what people told me, including Elvis. Uh, and I, I do believe that, uh, that it was Elvis's intent to give them a nice severance package. Uh, and I also, and this is not anything Elvis told me, but I, my sense is I believe Elvis 
was upset with him for different reasons. They sort of wanted to teach him a lesson, you know. And uh, but but I think it was his intent to bring them back. He Elvis fired me. He fired me over a disagreement. And uh, and two days later, he hired me back. So I mean, you know, Elvis was a he had a volatile temper. Uh, you know, he was like most artists. You know, it was uh, uh, he could be very dramatic and. Um, he wanted to make points and and you know and to convey his his uh, his emotions in a strong fashion, and when he would do that, sometimes he would get very angry and he would fire us, and sometimes he would fire different people and they would just ignore him and keep coming to work, you know, and then he would forget about it. So, that we had these things all the time. We were a bunch of guys, you know, working and living together. You know how this is, and and friends, and I just think this is one of those things. Had it been handled a little differently. The book would have never happened. They would have come back to work. Now, does that does that change the fact that the Elvis's end would have been any different? I don't know, because I think uh, the path that Elvis was on was destructive, whether he had intended it or not. And I think that, uh, unfortunately, his demise was was uh, going to happen without regard to whether or not Red Sonny and Dave Hebler were there or the book was written. So, no, the book didn't kill Elvis Presley. Uh, uh, Elvis's lifestyle killed Elvis Presley. And actually those people who was around him, including Sony, Sonny <laughs> and Brett and Dave and you and others, saved him also many times, you know. So in that way, you can say Red West also was very good for Elvis. He was there to make sure Elvis felt good and had good. According to Red, actually, he thought that he maybe got fired because he shortly before that had been uh, telling somebody that he would take the head off almost if they brought more of this shit to Elvis. And they told Elvis, and Elvis had him in. And uh, Red said to me, uh, I never forget his face when, uh, when he looked at me when I said, oh, you don't need those things, Elvis. You know, remember the good old days, you know, you don't need it. And he looked at Red and said, but Red, you don't understand, I need it. And he said, okay, it's up to you, Elvis. And then Red left. Uh, they were in the bedroom. But that was according to what Red West told me uh, some years Red, ago. Red West was, <clears throat> was an honest, straightforward man. Yeah. And I would take what Red West said, just as I would Billy Smith, to the bank, to be true. And without dwelling into the details of this, uh, the uh, reason that Elvis fired me was the same reason that, that he looked at Red that way too. Because I confronted him. And uh, he made a decision that he needed those pills more than he needed me and that I could go, was fired. And then he rehired me. So that did occur, it occurred to me. And all I can do is attest to what I saw, what I heard, and what I experienced. Well, if it happened to me, I'd have no doubt that he and Red had the same discussion. Uh, and uh, whether or not those are the reasons that, 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 that Red and Sonny and, and Dave were let go, I, I couldn't answer you. But I worked with all three of those guys. I liked those guys. They did a really good job. Uh, they protected Elvis. They loved Elvis. And, and I think in his own way, Elvis loved each and every one of them. But he truly loved Red West. They were brothers. Yeah. It's sad it ended up that way. Mm -hmm. Sam, it's been a pleasure talking to you again. And thank you very much for coming to Runners. I hope you'll be coming back again uh, next year or next year, uh, that you don't think, oh, now I want to retire. And, Stay home in California. No, I, I really enjoy coming here, Stig, seeing you and so many others. It's a lot of fun. Hen Henrik uh, and get to do a wonderful job there at the Memphis Mansion. I've, I've loved watching the, this thing evolve over the years. But next year, I'm not bringing my wife and my sister because they spend way too much money shopping around here. I hear actually the shops and runners is going much better this week. Oh, yeah. They've, man. they've <laughs> raised the sales a lot. Yeah, due to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, thank you again. Thank you. Og dermed er jeg nået frem til vejs ende af Welcome to my world i denne her uge. Jeg håber at se jer alle sammen tilbage igen i næste uge. Tak fordi I kiggede med. Welcome to my world Won't you come on in